Welcome to the Heal Your Hunger Show, where we get to the heart of why you overeat and how to stop. If you struggle with food and weight like I did, welcome home. Welcome to the Heal Your Hunger Show. So happy to have you here. It is a great day to be alive, and I am super excited about today's topic because it is born straight out of an experience I just had today. Literally today, I had an epiphany, and it just pulled everything into focus, and that's what I want to, what I want to share with you here right now. If you have not joined the Heal Your Hunger tribe, please jump over there and be a part of that. It's a great way for us to connect and for me to be able to share with you uh, insider tips and uh, interviews, guest interviews and fun events. So uh, just go to Facebook and type in the Heal Your Hunger Tribe and join us. Now for my topic today, I have to tell you, um, Boy, oh boy, you know, I, I, I'm going to tell you my experience and then I'm going to relate it back to uh, the experience of being an emotional eater because it's so analogous. Um, so the deal is my office where I work most of the time is a little bit messy at times. I am not an organized person typically, um, could be worse, it's not like a tornado hit it, but <laughs> um, I've grown since the tornado days, but still, it's not as neat as I would like to be. I'm not a type A. I don't keep uh, everything really, the paper's minimal. I don't throw everything out. I'm a little bit of a um, saver, hoarder, whatever, so so it's a little messy, and I don't like it. I'm visually uh, disturbed by my messiness, and uh, but not only that, um, you know, in terms of filing and keeping the bills straight and, uh, you know, scheduling, uh, you know, everything that needs to be paid on time and all that, that's a little challenging for me as well. So I have been known to miss some, uh, you know, deadlines and had to pay a fee or whatever, and that is super painful. I, I do not like that. <laughs> so in order to avoid the chaos of my... Uh, mind really is what we're talking about let's be real um i hired uh, an organizer many years ago so i hired an organizer to help me organize my office and she files stuff for me she uh, just keeps me on track and you know we'll go through papers and stuff and bills and um, we'll go through uh, insurance you know uh, plans and she's really good at checking to see if my deductibles are right or, or just whatever that's one of our fortes but but anyway things very a lot of detail that I normally blow off okay I just am not detail oriented and I, I don't like that stuff and so you know, surprise, surprise, I avoid it. I avoid it and neglect it. And so she keeps me on track. And when I first hired an organizer, I have to tell you, it was a real struggle for me. You know, I, I needed the help. Um, you know, for many years, I tried to do it on my own. I, I, I kept thinking how silly it would be to hire somebody, you know, and a, certainly an expense I didn't want to bear. So I tried to do it on my own. And the time and place came where I just couldn't. I had to come out of denial and admit, I, I can't do this myself. I'm not good at it. It's not my forte. It's not my skill set. It's not how my brain works. And I, I you know, I was so sick and tired of, of missing deadlines and having my place just look messy, you know, and not being able to find things and important things like my, you know, my registration for my car or my license, my, my car title or, you know, other uh, statements and such. So I hired an organizer. Now that was a big step for me. Um, you know, I had to get uh, out of denial and then I had to, uh, you know, accept that I was in despair. So I, I was, I came out of denial. I recognized that I was in despair and that desperation led me to make a decision. We got some D's going on here. So out of denial, uh, facing the sense of desperation that I had and making a decision to hire somebody. So those are the first three D's. And, uh, and, and I was glad that I did. But I uh, wasn't at totally at peace with the decision because for the first several years that she would come to my house every month, I would be grumpy. Oh my goodness, I would be so grumpy because I was still in conflict about my decision to hire her. You know, I was, my head was still saying, 
this is so stupid. You ought to be able to do this on your own. And uh, I have to say my husband didn't help a whole lot because these were his thoughts <laughs> that he sometimes let slip out once in a while. Like, really? Like, really? You need somebody else to do this for you? Uh, but his brain works differently for, than mine. And so um, I was kind of, you know, on my case about it. And and yet I was doing it because I knew I needed it. I was just conflicted. And so when she would be in my office, in my space, I would be kind of grumpy and overwhelmed and snippy at times. Like I'd take it out on her like like I was just mad. I was just mad and it would seep out, um, you know, in her direction when she was not the problem. But anyway, uh, for several years, I was just in that angst ridden place where I need the help and I'm not accepting the help. Like I'm, I'm not surrendering to the idea that I need the help. And so that was uncomfortable, but I kept doing it. Like I needed the help. There's no question about it. Um, and, and even though my head was, uh, you know, kind of, uh, loud about it, um, I did it anyway, but I was not at peace with it. The good news is that I did it anyway, okay? So the good news is I kept plodding along and we, every month she would come and it would be an expense that I would bear because I was dedicated to having an a, a organizer even when I didn't want one, even though I was mad at myself for needing one, even though I fought with myself every time she came and I was grumpy and down in the mouth. Um, I was dedicated to doing that. And so it's super, super important because here we are years later, years later. I, my files are still in great shape. Um, I depend you know, on our monthly meetings. Um, we get a lot done. Um, you know, I appear to be organized, um, even though I'm really not. Um, my mother thinks I am. <laughs> so uh, point is the dedication to this practice of um, having my organizer come has helped me tremendously to become an organized person to some extent, never where I want to be. Um, what happened today was a miracle. What happened today is I had a shift in my perspective, and that's really a spiritual awakening. Anytime you see from a new perspective, anytime you look through a new lens um, on a personal matter, something that uh, is important to you, something you've been struggling with, when you can see from a new perspective, you are home free. And that's what happened for me today. So what happened is, I, you know, even though I'm so much more at peace with having an organizer come and I love my gal, Jessica, she's just awesome. Um, even though I'm much more, you know, uh, at peace with the situation, there's still a little part of me that feels embarrassed, you know, feels embarrassed that I have this help. Uh, but the fact that I've been dedicated to this practice, regardless what my head says about it, I think brought me to this beautiful, wonderful awakening today. And what that awakening was, um, it was realizing that I'm not irresponsible for having an organizer. It doesn't mean I'm an ir irresponsible person. It actually means I'm a responsible person because I have a lot of things that need organizing. You know, I have uh, financial stuff. I've got bills. I, you know, uh, home ownership, uh, car ownership. I mean, there's a lot of balls in the air that if I didn't have help organizing uh, would be in disarray and then I would be irresponsible. So the responsible thing for me to do is have an organizer taking into account that I'm not type A, that I'm not typically organized. Um, I hired an organizer and yay for me, <laughs> yay for me that I hired an organizer and that I'm organized because of it. You know, I'm not an irresponsible person. I'm a responsible person. That's what a responsible person does when they need help. They actually ask for help and they get the help. So on the contrary of believing I'm a mess up and, and you know, flaky or, or, you know, incapable, whatever, I today saw full and clear, good for you, Trisha, you, took the important steps to get the help you need so that you don't end up, you know, at a loss and in a bad place, uh, in, in a mess. Totally cool. I was thrilled. I felt it also brought up when I got that, when I got it, you know, 
I was also super sad that I had spent so many years dissing myself for not accepting that I needed this help, for just fighting it, for fighting it and and being negative on myself. You know, I felt so much sadness, um, you know, and I just felt like I wanted to apologize. I did apologize to myself. I asked God to forgive me and, and I asked myself for forgiveness because I felt so sad for that sweet girl, you know, who got shit on by me, my adult self, my, my logical, critical parent, um, that I, you know, that I gave myself a hard time for so many years when in fact I was being responsible. So it made me sad to see that. So I had a little cry, you know, let the feelings pass. And then the rest of the time with my organizer, I was so happy. I was so happy. We had so much fun. We took a little break and had a little dance party, blared the music. It was awesome. So I just want to say that this experience of coming to a place of feeling deserving of this care, deserving of this opportunity to get help, uh, was an evolution. It didn't all come at once. Obviously, you heard what I just described as an evolution of acceptance and embracing this fact of my life. Um, I mentioned some different words that start with D, and I'll repeat them. I was in denial. Then I came to a point of desperation that led to a decision which, which uh, enabled me to be dedicated to this practice of having my organizer come. And that eventually, even though I made you know that decision, I was dedicated to it. I wasn't all in until I came to this awakening and of uh, feeling deserving. Okay, that's the last D is deserving. Like I now fully embrace that I need and deserve to have this help, and that it enables me to be a more responsible person. And I want to tie this back to your experience as an emotional eater, because I believe it's so similar. You know, as emotional eaters, we're in denial. We think we can do it ourselves. We certainly don't want to let people know that we have this problem. Uh, we don't uh, believe that we need help with it. We, we feel like we can pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and kick it on our own, uh, manage it on our own. But after a while, that denial uh, about being an emotional eater gives way to a great sense of desperation when we can't control our weight, when we can't control our eating, when we keep eating everything in the house, having to replace it so people don't know that we're the ones who ate the whole pie and ice cream. Uh, you know, that that uh, problem uh, turns into a monster and we are desperate and that desperation leads to a decision to finally reach out for help and you might purchase a course you know or a book or, or something where you can get start to get help um, in this case it's um, the freedom from emotional eating program so uh, you know once you do that once you uh, get despairing enough that you make a decision to get help from a coach and, and or from a program that's awesome but that you, you can't stop there right because you can you've probably bought a lot of things and not follow through with them so after that decision, it takes dedication, and that's applying yourself to whatever that solution is, doing everything you can, following through, doing every module, you know, not stopping it, module three or four or five, but actually finishing all the modules, um, you know, doing the, ex the, the whatever, you know, writing exercises, reading exercises, whatever, um, you know, dedicating yourself to a practice of healing, uh, that's something we forget. We make a decision, we reach out for help, but then we don't dedicate ourselves to that help. And that is vital. Uh, but it's not everything, right? Because you might still have an attitude. You might still be fighting yourself, still blaming yourself that you even need help at all. I mean, how many times have we done that? We've been like, like on our case that we can't do it alone, constantly, constantly, constantly fighting the idea that we have to get help. So you got to go one step further, you know, be dedicated, keep doing it, do it until that miracle happens. And that's when you feel deserving of it. That's when it's no longer a chore. That's when it's no longer a have to, or my coach is making me, uh, it becomes a wow, I deserve this. This is the right decision for me. I need this help. And you know, I was thinking about it. 
people don't have get into a head trip about hiring a trainer, uh, right? Like so many people, responsible, upstanding, you know, professionals go to the gym and and they uh, have a trainer who helps them, who trains them through and pushes them through the exercises. And that's a very accepted practice to have a trainer. If you can afford it, why not? Why not get that help? But when it comes to emotional eating, we resist it or, you know, or, or organizing, we resist it. We give ourselves a hard time. We think we shouldn't have to have a trainer. But people who work out know that a trainer is going to up their game. A trainer is going to help them follow through. A, a trainer is going to help them be accountable. So why not transfer that to emotional eating? Why not accept we need that help? Why not have a good attitude and say, yeah, you know, my trainer's here to help me uh, because this is something that I wouldn't do on my own. People know they're not going to exercise as hard on their own. And we're not going to apply ourselves to a solution for overcoming emotional eating on our own unless we have somebody there holding our hand and teaching us how to do it, showing us how to do it, and encouraging us to do it every single day. So you see where I'm going with this? So, so important to, uh, to really come out of denial, to really embrace a new way of living. Um, and then to get, you know, to be consistent enough that you have that shift in attitude where you fully, fully accept that this is helpful and this is the right choice and that you're actually responsible for making that choice and getting the help you need. So it's a shift in perspective. So, so important. I feel so much better now. I feel like I'm now sort of out from under that that self-condemnation and that feeling that I'm somehow less than because I need an organizer. And I'm like, wow, you know, good for me. I took that action, you know, and I want to encourage you to take action to get help with emotional eating and stop being in that muddle-headedness of trying to do it on your own. Um, you know, it's, it's not going to happen. Emotional eating is an addictive habit that uh, cannot be overcome on one's own. It's too big. We have to, you know, we have to eat three times a day, right? We have to take that that tiger, that that tiger out of the cage, and and say, "Nice kitty, pet the kitty." We try to pet the kitty three times a day, and then put it back in the cage without getting our asses torn off. <laughs> So that's not easy, um, and and trying to do that on your own is really an upward, uphill battle, if not impossible. So I hope you'll reach out for help, um, whatever that looks like, and just know that when you go through this process of uh, denial to desperation to decision to dedication to finally deserving help and care and assistance, you will be home free. I hope this resonates for you. Please reach out if I can be of service and make sure to go to the, to the Heal Your Hunger tribe and be a part of that fun experience. I love you so much and you have a great, great day. Take care. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to get free support, insider health info, exclusive invites to events and more, visit HealYourHunger.com.